like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Uh, I've been traveling around the world the last couple months uh, talking about healthy longevity to anybody that will listen, bus drivers, taxi drivers, anybody. Uh, currently, I'm in Jena, Germany, and we have this exciting meeting here, the Groningen Jena Aging Meeting. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is it's in an old electrical substation in Jena, and uh, this called the Imaginata, which has been converted now to a science education center. So it's really cool. Uh, if you are ever in Yena, go visit that. Uh, and uh, But today we have uh, James Payer on, who's the founder and CEO of Cambrian Biopharma. And uh, we'll be talking to him in a few minutes. Before we do that, uh, we have uh, Shermaine uh, Tin, who's talking about a recent paper on vitamin B12 and amyloid beta proteotoxicity. Hi, everyone. Today, I'll be breaking down some key findings in a recently released paper in Cell Reports by Lam et al. So Alzheimer's disease is an age-associated disease, which happens when there's an abnormal buildup of proteins. So this abnormal buildup forms amyloid plaques and tau tangles. So ultimately, um, the healthy neurons, they stop functioning, they lose connections with each other, and they die. And eventually, the brain starts to go through very distinct changes as seen in the picture. So memory problems are usually one of the first signs of the disease. So aging is a primary risk factor for Alzheimer's. And it's reported that one in 10 individuals aged 65 years and above will actually get Alzheimer's disease. So as seen here in the graph, its prevalence continues to increase with increasing age. So we know that diet has been implicated in longevity and health span, and in turn, it might be actually useful for diseases in which aging is a key driver of. So what this paper aims to do is to identify which are the key nutrients which could be helpful in improving Alzheimer's disease. So let me summarize a few key findings of this paper. So in this study, the authors essentially used a worm model called C. elegans. And through the modification of genes in this worm, they created a worm which essentially shows symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So this worm actually uh, goes through reduced ATP levels. Um, they have mitochondrial defects, very high oxidative stress. And interestingly, over time, they start to paralyze. So what was interesting about this study is that when the authors gave this Alzheimer's worms a different strain of food as compared to their standard diet. It actually took these worms a longer time to paralyze. And also, these worms showed a distinct improvement in Alzheimer's symptoms. For instance, they had improved ATP levels, they had lesser mitochondrial defects, and they also had very distinct lowered oxidative stress. So interestingly, what exactly was it about these diets that were better than the normal diets these worms were having? So what the authors first looked at was differences in macronutrient content. So macronutrient content is essentially your carbohydrates, your proteins. But they eventually found that it was not because of macronutrients. 
So instead, they started investigating micronutrients, which is your vitamins. And strikingly, when they used a reporter screening uh, to screen for vitamin B12 deficiency, they found two interesting things. So the first thing was that the Alzheimer's worms, which were fed the regular OP50 diet, was slightly B12 deficient. And secondly, the new diets that helped the Alzheimer's worms were actually higher in B12 content. So to see if the vitamin B12 was actually the crucial ingredient, they supplemented the regular diet that these worms were having with B12 alone. So strikingly, what they found was that B12 alone in, with the usual diet was actually enough to improve Alzheimer's disease symptoms in these worms. So additionally, when they grew treated adult Alzheimer's worms with vitamin B12, they were also able to see a significant improvement in the symptoms of these worms. Um, so this is especially relevant because it highlights the potential benefit for dietary vitamin B12 supplementation, even in later life in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So going a little further, they found that the reason for the effectiveness of vitamin B12 is because of its role in a, as a cofactor um, in a reaction called the methionine sem e pathway. So preventing this reaction uh, by knocking out a key enzyme actually cancelled out the beneficial effects of the special diet. So lastly, uh, when they supplemented products of this reaction, for example, methionine, um, it actually helped to greatly improve the symptoms of the Alzheimer's disease worms. So they found that the major effect was because of the pathways involvement in making phosphatidylcholine a major component of lipid membranes. And true enough, actually, phosphatidylcholine has been found to be lowered in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So supplementation of phosphatidylcholine to Alzheimer's disease worms were also able to confer beneficial effects. So in a nutshell, um, this paper actually highlights the usefulness of vitamin B12 in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it also highlights the role of the methionine SEM-E cycle, uh, which helps to pro produce phospholipids, which may be helpful in Alzheimer's disease. So it will be very interesting actually to see future studies evaluate the role of similar macro and micronutrients um, in aging and age-related diseases as they did in this uh, study in Alzheimer's disease. So um, that's all for the findings. Thank you. You know, it's interesting that pathways involved in methionine biosynthesis uh, uh, touch on a, a number of different regulatory pathways that influence aging. And so, we, you know, it seems like in more and more of these studies, we keep coming back to this pathway, but we don't really understand exactly what it's doing to, to, to mediate the aging process. So it'll be interesting to see what future research uh, leads to in that area. So as I mentioned, James Payer is the founder and CEO of uh, Cambrian Biopharma. And they build uh, uh, medicines that will extend health span. Uh, before that, he's also the chairman of the board of Sensei Biotherapeutics and previously was founder and managing partner of Apollo Ventures, was, which was really the first venture uh, approach to longevity. So he's been in the field about as long as anybody uh, and um, in terms of investing in aging. So it'll be really exciting to hear what he has to say. The title of his talk is... Uh, uh, redefining healthcare in the 21st century, targeting diseases before they happen. Thanks for coming on, James. Thanks, Brian. And I would uh, I would never propose to hold a candle in terms of like, you know, the the OGness of the aging space to uh, to you. Um, but no, I really appreciate you having me. Um, I think the format that we're planning here is that I'll. Um, tell the group a little bit about Cambria and kind of what we do and how we approach aging for a few minutes. And then I'm really looking forward to the discussion in the Q and A, which is like the meat and the fun part of talks like this that we can get into afterwards. So good. I'm going to share my screen and do a few slides and then we will, uh, then we'll jump in. So as Brian mentioned, my name is James Pyre. I'm 
the CEO and founder of this company, Cambrian Biopharma. Um, my background is as a scientist. So I, I studied in the in the aging field, but then uh, took a different route from many of the academics that have continued study in this space and kind of took a, a right turn into the biotech world. Um, and yeah, did some spent some time investing and now um, we do kind of a, a hybrid version of both investing and building drugs in the uh, in the aging space, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So most of you guys probably have um, quite a bit of context and what's going on in the field, but I always like to start talking about Cambrian with, uh, with this slide, which is that we are really, like to emphasize, we're really on the verge of a revolutionary change in, in how we how we approach the diseases of aging. We have now at the academic level discovered more than 75 different compounds that can extend healthy lifespan, both median and maximum of mammals. And I really, really believe that humans are next in line. And the way that we have done this is by fundamentally changing our approach to these diseases. So the way that the healthcare system is structured right now, we are essentially waiting for, for damage to build up in people over decades before we ever use our understanding of biology to do something about it. Um, but little by little over, especially the last eight years, we've come to understand at the biochemical and molecular level, what the damage is that's building up in our body. And so you can see on this slide that kind of, you know, from the time that really we're, uh, we're exiting, or, you know, the time we're entering puberty, through our 50s and 60s, there's this prolonged period of damage accumulation that does not necessarily result in overt disease, but that damage is happening. Our DNA is being mutated. Uh, aggregates are building up in our tissues. Our, our extracellular matrices are stiffening. Our stem cells are getting exa exhausted, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not doing anything from a, uh, a treatment perspective to counteract these damage. this damage. People will just say, oh, well, you know, have good diet and, and exercise regularly. And that's all we can do. I think that's going to change because our approach to the major diseases of aging that you can see along the right here, um, by waiting for these diseases to happen and then trying to unwind them, we have been like profoundly unsuccessful at treating or, or curing any of these diseases. And I, I really believe that this field of studying the biology of aging is going to give us the only solution that we will have to any of these major diseases, which are the, the primary killers of humankind today. And so when I think about how this field has evolved and will evolve, I, will evolve, I like to put some very rough timelines in place. And, you know, don't, don't hold me to these numbers. It's more of like a framework to understand what I think is going on in the field, which I think incorporates four key, um, four key pieces. The first of which really defined the last decade, the 2010s, which is, you know, academics all over the world discovering different ways to extend uh, longevity of mice and other, uh, and other model organisms. And now the the foundational challenge for the first part of the 2020s is to take those discoveries, those breakthroughs that can extend the lifespan of model organisms and show that th those insights can turn into safe and effective medicines uh, in humans. And I, I want to emphasize here that the the way that these new drugs built on insights in the biology of aging will first reach humans is not in, so to say, aging studies, right? Not necessarily in things that will uh, be given to healthy, normal people to see if they will live longer. Those trials take a very long time to do and are very, very expensive. So the way that we approach it at Cambrian is to figure out, you know, if you have a drug that can prevent multiple diseases of aging at the same time and make a mouse or another model organism live longer and healthier? Is there at least one disease where if you can't cure it, you can at least create a better treatment than anything else out there? And unsurprisingly, um, we've found uh, for pathway after pathway that the, this field of geroscience or the study of aging has given us fundamental new insights in how we treat the diseases of today. And that's how this field will start. Uh, but then we will use those first diseases that we're testing 
uh, testing these drugs in as a stepping stone to conduct trials for what I call MMR, or this is multi-morbidity risk. Uh, so basically the risk of getting cancer, Alzheimer's disease, you know, age-related diabetes, frailty, uh, heart disease, all at the same time kind of packaged into one. And, and the barrier today for doing these trials, uh, I'll get back to this a little bit at the end of this, of this presentation, is that we don't have clinical surrogate endpoints, basically something that will allow us to be an endpoint for a clinical trial for this multi-morbidity risk. And so um, kind of the second pillar of what I see Cambrian doing over the next decade, as we're doing all of these placebo-controlled clinical trials in diseases, um, like the first diseases that are going to be treated with these drugs, we will also be measuring and compiling data to inform uh, to inform regulators such as the FDA, but also other groups, what these clinical surrogate endpoints uh, of, of multimorbidity risk could be so that we could conduct clinical trials in those healthy, uh, otherwise healthy, but aging people that are not, you know, 15, 20 year long clinical trials, but instead two or three years. And once you nail both of these pieces, you have safe and effective human medicines and a regulatory pathway to test drugs for multimorbidity risk, then you can combine those together and actually approve the first medicines specifically to extend health span. And so I think this leads us up pretty well to understanding what Cambrian is. So I call us a distributed biotech company and, and we're developing a whole pipeline of new medicines, tar uh, partnering with different researchers all over the world who study the biology of aging and have made individual breakthroughs. Um, and so we pair those discoveries at different academic centers with our in-house team that includes um, a, a group of drug development professionals that have taken a whole lot of drugs from, you know, not, not from uh, just the discovery stage, but also all the way into the clinic and, and deep into clinical trials and have uh, gotten drugs approved. And we also have an operations team to kind of run each of these little biotech companies that lives underneath the Cambrian banner. Um, and so we can, I don't wanna spend a, a ton of time on this, but I think how each different uh, biotech group in the space approaches um, the field of geroscience or the field of aging biology is really fascinating. And, and the way that we do it is by using a variant of uh, Robert, Koch's print, Koch, uh, Robert Koch's principles. And so Koch was you know, one of the found, foundational thinkers in virology, he won the Nobel Prize in like the early 1900s uh, for coming up with three principles of what it uh, of like identifying a pathogenic agent. Uh, and so our reframing of Koch's postulates for, for aging are that we wanna work on pathways that change for the worse with, with aging when they're around or amplified, accelerate the onset of aging diseases. And when we remove them, slow the onset of, of aging diseases. Um, and you, know, you can reframe that as a positive or negative. We don't have to get into it deeply. But that's kind of given us 13 different areas that Cambrian focuses on that we uh, ball together in these three uh, kind of headings of changes to how our molecules are working, changes to how our cells are working, and degeneration at the tissue level. And that's allowed us to assemble a portfolio that we don't have time to go into today of 14 different drugs, the first of which are going to be entering clinical trials next year. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the economics of this, except to say that if you're a biotech company, it pays to have a lot of different shots on goal because drug development from first in human trials to, uh, to ultimately bringing a drug to patients is really risky. So the more shots on goal you have, the more confidence that you can have that at least one and ideally more than one of those drugs are going to be um, making it all the way through clinical trials. And um, and so the, the last kind of piece that I'll give you on how Cambrian works and how I, and, and, and what makes us a little bit special in this, in this field is that we kind of combine a traditional biotech or pharma team with a, uh, a venture capital team. And so we, we actually have a full-time ventures team underneath Cambrian that's 
going out, talking with professors uh, all over the world and identifying breakthroughs that are being made in this space and then partnering with them to create small biotech companies. But instead of then saying, okay, you know, professor so-and-so, um, please now go build a biotech company around this and go get funding for it and all of this other stuff. Uh, we say, okay, well, now we can drop in our research and development teams, our finance teams, our patent professionals, you know, everything else that you would need to build a biotech company comes right from Cambrian. And then we cement that partnership and define a set of key experiments that are needed to de-risk uh, any any hypothesis in in this uh, in this aging field, and then run those experiments together with our academic partners, and kind of you know set a key experiment, run the experiment, see how it looks, set a new key experiment, run that experiment, and kind of uh, turn that cycle over and over and over again for every program that we get involved in until we see proof of concept in in human clinical trials, and. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but, but what this looks like in practice is you create, you kind of plant all of these seeds. Each one of these circles on the left is like a, a preclinical uh, breakthrough that turns into a biotech company. And, and you can plant all of these seeds, these individual breakthroughs as a biotech company year after year after year. And then there's an attrition process because not every hypothesis will work out, but some number of them will start moving into clinical trials. And so we take this very kind of, um, I like to call it the money ball approach to biotech development because we are, you know, making a lot of different um, a lot of different bets with fantastic people and moving just the best ideas forward to clinical trials. And so we have a pretty fantastic team that can do this. Cambrian started about two years ago, uh, and we currently work with over a hundred uh, different people around the world that are kind of part of the, the greater Cambrian super, super organism. I'm not going to highlight anyone here today because it's not the purpose of this talk, but I'm, I'm really uh, amazed by the, the group of people that have come together under, uh, under Cambrian. And, and then the last piece maybe that I want to mention before we get to the, to the fun part is around the path that these drugs will take to ultimately get regulatory approval for aging. Uh, and, and kind of my lead into this that I like to talk about is right now we're in this era where the longevity biotech field is just emerging and, and all of the companies that are playing in this space, including Cambrian, are trying to use the insights of the geroscience field in order to build better drugs for diseases today. And I think that that's going to be a, a, an enormous business. But if we can nail this uh, biomarker-based clinical trial for healthy longevity, for healthier longevity that I alluded to earlier, then it will start a second era of this field where we don't just use the insights of aging to treat the diseases of today, we will actually create an entirely new field that we could call longevity pharma to prevent these diseases before they ever happen. And I think that that field will actually overtake and be bigger than the traditional pharma world today. And so in, in order to do that, we have to ask, how do we get there? What are the missing links between today and that future state? And, and we really think that there's five points. I want to run through them really quickly, and then we can go to the, to the discussion. So the first one is that I think that these longevity therapeutics are going to tread the regulatory path of statins. And I think uh, atorvastatin, which is most people know as Lipitor, is probably the closest parallel to what one of these, uh, what a clinical trial pathway will look like for a drug that slows aging. And that is number one, it, it will be approved first for something that has nothing to do with preventing aging, right? Uh, atorvastatin was first approved for rare orphan hypercholesterolemia. And then secondly, it will have to be run in this biomarker-based clinical trial um, that can be run in two or three years. In the case of statins, that was high LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol. And they, they show that, okay, you can lower that LDL cholesterol and that would be enough to get the drug approved and on the market. And then you would watch over the next decade or more uh, to see whether 
to see whether heart disease risk and stroke risk was really changed after you modify that biomarker. And, and that's the missing piece um, in the aging space right now is that we don't have a biomarker that has been validated that a regulator would approve for, for this field. But the science is maturing rapidly. And so we have now more than a dozen different putative biomarkers of multimorbidity risk that could be in theory used for, uh, for, for one of these clinical trials, but it needs to be, we need a lot more data, especially from placebo controlled clinical studies to show that, um, that whatever biomarker we're interested in measuring changes with an intervention. And then we need an additional set of data to show that those changes in that biomarker correlate with a reduction of risk uh, of mul these multiple diseases of aging, basically slow aging. And so my view is that in order to get there, a group with a truly long-term vision, right? Not on the order of venture capital returns, which are usually in like the three to five year range, but more in the five to 20 year timeframe, which very, very few investors have. Um, that group needs to run a lot of different clinical trials with multiple different longe longevity drugs collecting the same biomarkers. And I know that actually um, Brian's group at, at NUS, as well as a few other uh, really pioneering academic groups are thinking about running studies like this. But Cambrian is also set up to run clinical trials um, in the here and now, but with a really long-term vision to collect data to, to generate value uh, in this field over the next decade. And by combining this data from new clinical trials with all of these correlational sources that have built all of these different biomarkers, uh, putative biomarkers of aging, and then using algorithmic approaches to lump them together, we can create a composite biomarker of multimorbidity risk that will then be able to take to the FDA. And that should allow us to do clinical trials that could be finished in two to three years instead of, you know, 10. And, um, and that will also allow us, and I think this is key and where it will get really interesting, is not just to do silver bullet trials, right? We don't think that there's going to be any single drug that can increase an average, uh, the, a person's life expectancy from 80 to 100. But a combination approach, we think, will be able to do that. And so once you have this short iteration time for clinical trials uh, and, and a biomarker to look at, then you can start running combination studies much more easily as well, which is where a big part of the gains for healthy longevity are going to come from. And so with that, I don't think I need to summarize Cambrian too much, um, but I appreciate everybody paying attention and let's get into the discussion part of this. Thanks, James. That was great. I think you're very clear, and I think the audience will understand, you know, what you're thinking. Um, you know, it's interesting because you, you know you're you've been with with two venture groups now, or, or one venture group and one uh, bio biotech collector group, <laughs> uh, putting a lot of money into the field. And but now it seems like in the last five years, there's money coming from a lot of different sources. Uh, do you, you view that as a, a good thing? And when is, when is there enough money in the private sector development space for this field? Yeah, so I think we're at this stage right now that is truly sort of a, a rising tide lifting all ships, right? So the more time and energy and money that can be spent on the longevity space, the better it is for everyone in the field. Um, and and I think that for me, it's really about, about okay, Let's then spend a lot of time asking what the key things are that really advance the field and make sure that if a lot of money is coming in, let's spend it on those things. So part of, uh, part of what I've seen is like, I think much of the money that's come in has actually not gone to the most critical projects that expand, that expand the field. Um, and so we don't have to get into like, you know, naming names and pointing fingers. Um, but I think that the, the two pieces that, that I think are most critical for advancing this field and, and where the capital should really be spent on, maybe I'll add in three. Um, number one is more basic research in this space is that we really need to continue understanding what each of these pathways do and how they interact. I just want, um, I, I just want everybody to know that I didn't pay James to say that. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, th and then the other two, I think uh, I covered a little bit in the presentation. The first one is to take drugs that we think can be developed for, have, have a uh, geroprotective effects, right? That they will extend healthy lifespan in mice and potentially humans, but then get those drugs to the points of safety and efficacy in human trials. And then, and then uh, lastly, like running clinical studies in humans and collecting just tons of biomarkers from those studies to enable this biomarker or surrogate biomarker of multimorbidity risk that I was talking about. I think that at that point, the whole field changes. It's going to be a fulcrum for the entire industry. And, and so if it's not money going towards one of those three things, then I think it's being put in the wrong place. Um, but I think that at least a substantial fraction is going to one of those three. You know, I think you make a key point there on that last issue because, you know, you look at some of the uh, money going into the field and, you know, the, it's called longevity, but really there's a lot of investment in just diseases that are related to aging. Uh, yeah. And that's not the end of the world. We need to understand that, but I'm not sure how much of it is directed at longevity. And so the, the ability to collect that data that's maybe off target for the disease of interest, but very important for aging, I think is... Uh, is critical to going forward. And, and one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, as much as it is driven by the science, there's also an aspect that's actually driven by the strategy of the group that is advancing that science, right? Are they set up in a way that they can, tr that they can conceive of their drug development program, let's say, as not just treating a disease today, but also be thinking about and testing it on that kind of like decade long timeline, right? One of the big problems in industry generally, but biotech specifically is short-termism. And yeah. so if we want to be building a field that is going to like be making a difference in the aging world, we have to, you know, I used to I used to go around and like bang my fist on a on a podium back when the aging field was was more embryonic, um, and and say hey if you've made a breakthrough in aging we have to go after a disease today in order to build a biotech company out of it. But I think that the field has almost learned that lesson a little bit too well, and now we have all of these companies that are taking an insight in aging and going after a disease of today, but they don't really have the long-term vision and they're not actually investing their resources yeah. to, to think about how they're going to be treating healthy people that are aging. Five and, when the money, years and when the money gets tight, you know, the first thing that may go are these long-term data collection strategies, right? Because it's not At, central to the immediate uh, return. So Exactly. And, and I've seen that over and over again and talked with investors who, even if they're kind of like, um, even if they're thinking, oh, yeah, we're really into this for the longevity side of this. Like you said, Brian, it feels like money is always tight. And the moment you have to make any compromises or any cuts, that's the thing that happens first, um, which is one of the reasons that that I chose to uh, organize Cambrian the way that we did so that we have full control and can twist, uh, can, can make sure that we have control over the capital and have it at the very top of our priority list to do yeah, but to do our studies in that way. Yeah, and I, I'm convinced you'll do that, but but the money always gets tight. So I mean, one of the questions oh, I had is, you've got a huge number of pathways and, and that you're going after. Once you get into the clinic, it's going to get extremely expensive, especially when you get into phase two and phase three. So what's the strategy there? Do you plan to take things all the way to market, or is it finding partners that can help you do that? So so it's a mix of both. Um, we're we're a few. Uh, a little bit early, but I have some cool some cool news that we get to talk about next week um, that that has to do with this with this strategy. But I will say that um, number one, in order to run a program like Cambrian, I sometimes jokingly call it the hungry beast model of biotech development. Because mm -hmm. if you want to be making a lot of different shots on goal and and fully resource all of these. Um, partner companies that, that we've kind of brought underneath the Cambrian banner, it does take an awful lot of capital to do that. And capital that has to then be wisely deployed to you know run key experiments and not pay for a whole lot of fluff uh, outside of that, especially if you are prioritizing keeping that capital around for these big biomarker studies mm -hmm. for every one of our clinical trials. Um, and, and so for each of the programs underneath the Cambrian banner, we actually do look at it with multiple lenses at the same time. But the first one is that 
if you really want to make a difference in this aging field and you want to be building a drug that's going to be a gera protector, I think that you can't build a biotech company whose plan is to be sold to you know one of the big pharma companies, the Pfizer's, et cetera, of the world um, after getting phase two data. And that's the way that most biotechs are structured right now. And so our plan is not, okay, get something to phase two and give it to, give it to a pharma company, get something else to phase two and give it to a pharma company. I think that that's just not going to result in the innovation and the clinical risk-taking that this field needs in order to get to that fulcrum point. Yeah. Um, and, and so when we start a program, we are actually gearing up to say, hey, look, if this continues to be excellent on the scientific side, we will figure out a way to bring the capital in to advance this all the way to commercialization and beyond to the second indications. And that may be finding partners to, um, to like do some of the sales and some of the you know, funding of the late stage trials while holding on to many of the rights and the R&D aspects of this. But because we're a company and not a VC fund that has to sell all of our shares in that, in that asset in you know, five to seven years, we get a lot more flexibility with how we think about this pipeline yeah. of assets under Cambrian. I mean, and that, this can be a challenge too, because if a drug does get a for something, you often find that whatever company controls that drug now gets very risk averse to trying it toward any other indication, and especially the, you know healthy longevity might scare some people. So um, I, it could be a concern going down the road. So. It, yes, although I think that the counterfactual is also a compelling argument. I look at Merck, for for example, um, who you know after they saw some of the addition, uh, the initial data on Keytruda this immunotherapy for cancer, um, Roger Perlmutter, the head of R&D for Merck, they kind of like bet the whole farm of this giant pharma company, no pun intended there, um, they, they bet the farm on this Keytruda drug and are running really you know, hundreds, even someone told me thousands of trials uh, on Keytruda for every different type of cancer indication that you can imagine. And so I think that when the right molecule and the right drug comes along that looks like it has efficacy in cancer prevention and, you know, heart disease prevention and all of these other things, you know, slowing the, the onset of frailty, uh, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, on down the list, there will be a partner somewhere along the way. And maybe it's Cambrian, maybe it's one of the existing big pharma companies that will say, hey, this thing is going to continue working. We're already going to be making a boatload of money for disease X with this, and it's the right move to run as many different clinical trials as possible because the risk-adjusted upside for the money that we have to put into this trial is just positive every single time because we know that this thing is working so well. And so I think that we'll find that kind of Keytruda example in the aging space. It's just that we're not there yet. Are you, uh, it seems like you're totally focused on drug development. Is it, so is the strategy with new chemical entities, it's not with repurposed drugs so much or? Uh, that, that's right. And, so, so Cambrian is, is 100% patented, um, patented drug-like uh, products. And so we have, I think, one or two programs in the portfolio that are like new IP on natural products. Um, but it will all come together in like a, you know, a therapeutic development drug-like portfolio and, you know, greater than 90% is, is new chemical entities. What about things like, you know, gene therapy? I think that's going to get a big boost, you know, especially with the mRNA vaccines and, and um, are you guys thinking down some of these longer term paths yet? Yeah. So um, I think gene therapy and longevity are, are actually kind of tough to tie together because there are so many delivery issues in the gene therapy space still, right? You have to be able to ask the question, all right, are there genes where if we overexpress X in a small fraction of you know, hepatocytes uh, or, or blood cells that we can get have a serious systemic effect on, on longevity? And I think that that's a, a de minimis uh, list, but there are some other places where these next generation therapies, I think, are going to play a big role. And the big one for us is is actually an induced pluripotent stem cells and the, and the interplay of that in, with stem cell exhaustion. So we've been following. I think most people in the space have been following this idea of epigenetic reprogramming or partial reprogramming in the space. That's really exciting. Um, but our view is that. There's been quite a few steps between where we are today and, and overexpressing yeah. these genes in a clinical trial. Yeah. But, but the way to get there 
is to really master you know, how induced pluripotent stem cell biology is going to be used in the clinical setting today. And so one of the programs that we've actually announced that's under the Cambrian banner is, is one where a group out of Johns Hopkins nailed the, the process for turning iPSCs into um, muscle stem cells that can integrate in and, and form healthy muscle. And so we actually uh, invested in, in that company and are building this program, which can derive iPSCs from a person, kind of do all of that in vitro, mm -hmm. um, use CRISPR to gene correct uh, a, a gene of a muscular dystrophy patient, and then turn that into healthy, uh, functional muscle stem cells that can then uh, incorporate into a person with dystrophy in the first case. But then our view is that we could actually make it inexpensive enough to do it with a person that has sarcopenia, age-related muscle weakness yep. on down the line. And so I think yeah. that kind of next generation stuff, we actually are making big, big bets on it. We're, we're starting to work more on IPS cells and we're work, working with a company that uh, has hypoimmunogenic cells. So the idea is, can we use a universal donor to, to address some of these questions? And I, I think it's a really interesting strategy going forward. Uh, you know, cell replacement therapy got popular a long time ago and some things didn't work out well, but I, I think that there's a lot of, potential there in the long term definitely so. Com completely agree and it, it's only going to get better and better as we figure things out and so i think mm. you know a, a, a repeated theme of how i approach this whole field is like let's figure out how we can de-risk and understand and make this technology work as an investment case in the short term you know in the short term horizon with very little regulatory risk today and then use all of that learning where we can kind of then throw our minds into the future and say, okay, how will this inform us to be able to do something really fundamental for JARA science, you know, uh, four or five years down the road? You know, I think one of, one of the big issues in this field is you've got drugs that target longevity pathways. And while you're definitely interested in, in aging directly, as you said, you still have to pick disease indications in the short term. So how do you match you know, drugs to diseases, that's something we struggle with. And I think everybody in the longevity field is trying to figure out how to do that. So, so my, my short and kind of glib answer to that is th this is what we've built the entire Cambrian team specifically to do. And it's sort of the, the special sauce of, of the organization that we've built, mm -hmm. right? So we have this whole uh, this whole team of expert drug developers, people who have moved things into the clinic, you know, time after time after time uh, in the big pharma context. And, mm -hmm. and then we also have folks who have done PhDs in aging biology and like all of these different aspects who have then spent time in venture investing or, you know, banking or consulting, working in the healthcare industry and like merging those two groups together with a set of rules that we have come up with as a team um, to kind of put these things through their paces, right? For every different uh, asset, right? Every breakthrough that we see, we kind of start from first principles, analyzing the molecular pathway, and then kind of build that up to commercially viable de-risked indications the best that we possibly can. And, and so, there's no perfect way of doing this. And oftentimes there's major gaps in the data. One of the things that I like to joke about is that, you know, if everyone just followed the data in choosing their first indications in longevity, there would be a million trials for kidney disease yeah. because the kidneys are one of the easiest things to measure yeah. that, that you can see in, uh, in aging studies in mice. And so we have, you know, so much evidence that the kidneys are helped, but that doesn't mean that you position every single drug for treating acute kidney uh, disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that you really need to take a mechanistic focused first principles approach to this field. And, yeah. and we've basically built the team to do that, but it's never a simple, uh, it's, it's never a simple task. I think things can be non-obvious too. Like there's one drug that we're interested in that we think a childhood rare disease is probably the best place to go to start with you. And no one would call that an aging disease. So it's, uh, you know, it takes a, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, especially if you take a drug like, you know, rapamycin, which has been very prominent in the field targeting the TOR pathway, you could choose any of a thousand indications and, and uh, it, it's, <laughs> It and that may be true for a lot of longevity interventions because by definition, in some ways, they target multiple downstream pathways. And so- Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think that the, 
you know, back to, you know, what's easiest to show safety and efficacy in human trials right now for a series of different regulatory reasons and the fact that there's an enormous unmet need in especially childhood genetic diseases. Mm-hmm. Um, from a regulatory and cost perspective, it's one of the easiest places to yeah. start testing a drug in, in humans if you can really make a difference. And so it's mm-hmm. not an accident that of our of our portfolio, actually three out of our 14 are going to be in human clinical trials in childhood genetic diseases mm-hmm. um, to start with. And then each of them target some fundamental mechanistic pathway that also goes awry in aging. And so we're going to use it in aging afterwards. Yeah, I, I was I was interested by your three principles. You know, worse with age, um, pathway accelerates aging, and uh, when you get rid of it, things get better. Um, and almost by definition, you're selecting drugs then that sort of attempt to restore pathways to a youthful state, and uh, and that makes sense because a lot of the interventions that have been developed so far seem to do that. Uh, but I'm wondering what you think about extra physiological interventions. And because uh, hmm. th- I'm starting to think a lot about this, and it may be that those are the ones that really break the barriers down as opposed to, you know, the things that restore a more youthful state. They're obviously beneficial. You know, I'm, I'm testing a lot of them, but, but maybe if you really want to get to, you know, fantasy land in terms of slowing aging, you may have to go extra physiological. So, so I actually agree with this because you know when you ha- when you're in, when you're in this complex web of different causes and effects that that ultimately results in aging right we're never going to be able to turn the dial on every single pathway that is going wrong at the same time but by pumping one pathway up or getting rid of one pathway to the to a super physiological extent you know you can kind of pull all of these interconnected pathways in the same direction. Um, And that will be true in some cases and not true in others. I think mTOR is a good example where like, you know, you don't want to go crazy because if you completely, you know, shut down mTOR signaling cells can't divide. Um, But, but I think that there are many different pathways where, you know, the dose, let's call it the dose finding exercise. Once you've said, okay, Hey, this thing is changing with age. If you have, you know, it can be more, it can be less, but like, I'm going to say more knowing that it can be the presence of, or absence of that signal accelerates aging. And the absence of the signal slows aging. Um, and, and if you hit those three things, then it's, then you do a dose finding exercise Mm -hmm. to figure out, okay, Hey, if we just return this to youthful levels, then what effect do we get? How about if we go beyond that? How about if we go 10 times that? What's, yeah. what's the effect? And then you yeah. can use that to kind of calibrate your safety and efficacy signal at the preclinical level and then take it into humans. And I think as long as you're constantly thinking about, all right, what's that safety versus efficacy line, um, you end up usually with the biggest dose that gives the biggest effect that's still very, very safe for people to yeah, take. I don't think we have an example of this yet, but I think that, you know, that may be the way to get to the big breakthroughs. Um, I'm yeah, going to bring in uh, Max uh, uh, Unfried, who's also traveling all over the place. Where are you, Max? Uh, hi, guys. I'm currently in Lisbon on the blockchain week, actually, um, trying <laughs> to spread the uh, longevity word a little bit there. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, as usual, we got quite a few questions. Uh, maybe let's start with the highest upvoted one, which is there are many hallmarks of aging that can potentially be targets to improve healthy longevity. Um, James, in your opinion, which one do you think we should be, be targeting and why? So I don't think that we should be targeting one. I think that the hallmarks are a great framework to understand the interlinked kind of causes of aging. But I think that the way that this field makes progress is by advancing many different ideas that target these different hallmarks forward at the same time. Because drug development is just such a risky, it's a risky game, right? Many of the of the insights that we have, the breakthroughs that we have, are not ultimately going to result in drugs that reach patients. And so the way that Cambrian thinks is we want, we need to be able to target every one of these hallmarks of aging that is druggable and do that with as many shots on goal as the same time at the same time, because some of them won't work. And so, um, 
you know, whether it's epigenetic changes or, or telomeres, uh, telomere shortening or DNA damage or, you know, stem cell exhaustion and aggregate buildup, we target all of those things. Um, and I think that it's, it doesn't really matter which one ends up getting approved first. I think that what matters is it, if you have a drug that has the potential to slow down aging and has a fantastic safety profile where it looks like it could go into healthy individuals to test to be tested there, then you've got something really interesting on your hands. And that can come from any of the hallmarks, all of which, by the way, made it onto that list because they had demonstrated some amount of single agent GERA protection. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that maybe other hallmarks with the single uh, GERA protection protective issue will pop up on your search? <laughs> I think that they already have. So actually, our the reason that we have these little 13 causes of aging as opposed to the nine hallmarks that were that were published in 2013 is that we think that the hallmarks list doesn't perfectly map onto drug development hypotheses. Um, and and you know there have even been some some supplements to that original 2013 paper that you know didn't include extracellular matrix stiffening and, and changes to the ECM as an example. And that's a, play, uh, a field that we're actually really, really interested in and building some stuff on. Well, uh, David has another question um, and just wants to know what, what makes you unique from all the other geoscience biotechs that are emerging and are out there? So um, I would, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, but I also think that, you know, the the evidence will will kind of speak for itself as we continue to move forward so i don't want to toot our own horn too much but i think number one is that we think very 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 deeply about this indication selection problem that brian was talking about before um, and i think that the combination of really deep expertise in drug development um, that we can deploy into every one of Cambrian's programs combined with what is essentially the longest history in this longevity biotech field that anyone can claim uh, from a company building perspective. When those two pieces come together, we've created something really, really special. And that's allowed us to grow much faster and much bigger than any other company in this space. Um, so, you know, I, I think that as we go forward over the next year, the results of what we're able to do will, will really speak for themselves. Um, but I think that that's a big part of what makes Cambrian special is that we brought all of the different pieces that you need really under the same roof. And we're moving forward just much more aggressively, much more, uh, much more quickly than, than any of the other companies that I've seen in the space. I like this ambitious approach for like a healthy future. Um, <laughs> I mean, some people have like some questions about uh, biomarkers. Um, like Jeremy Lim asks, uh, where do you think uh, the earliest validated or generally accepted biomarkers for aging will be emerging, like from plat or like from stool genomics? Uh, what's your thought on that? So my approach here is actually to be somewhat agnostic. Um, and so I think as a field, we've come up with a whole series of really great hypotheses, right? The most famous is probably Steve Horvath's methylation clock. Um, but Elena Slagbloom from, from Leiden has a, a metabolomics-based uh, clock. There are, you know, Bjorn Schumacher has, has looked into uh, transcriptomic clocks that work in, that seem to work in humans. And so we have a whole series, of, by, my, by my count, it's over 12 that have um, looked at long-term data sets and, and built correlations based on those long-term data sets, usually from uh, biobanked blood samples that predict outcomes, whether it's mortality or morbidity, much better than chronological age as, as a single, you know, uh, as, as a single set of measurements. And Though each of those 12 have been proposed to be suitable biomarkers for, for aging, but I think that they're suitable in the sense that they predict uh, morbidity risk better than chronological age. And that's not good enough for these clinical trials. And so I think nobody has really started running the analysis to say, okay, if we hold ourselves to the standard of a surrogate predictive endpoint, as opposed to doing better than chronological age, which one of these things or which combination of them is going to be the best. And I think that that's a big part of the 
the energy that Cambrian can bring into the space is because we're going to be running all of these placebo controlled clinical studies, we can actually clip on biomarker measurements for all of these different things at the same time, kind of put them in competition with each other. And then that's where kind of, a, a, you know, the machine learning or the algorithmic approaches come in, where if you collect data sets of all of these things together, then you can ask, okay, which one explain is like the top one to explain correlations. And then if you add in a second one, how, how much better can you get at prediction and so on. And then, so I think it'll be a composite biomarker that takes elements from many of these different, you know, by uh, aging clocks that ultimately ends up being our, our multimorbidity risk biomarker at the end of the day. We have like a question from Deb in, uh, in this direction. And Singapore being like a very multicultural and multi-ethnical state, right? Um, do you um, see or any expect any variations between different ethnic populations for those biomarkers for like your uh, risk prediction? So let me, let me answer this in two ways very quickly. Yes, we would expect things, but it has to work well enough that the the differences based on you know ethnicity gender or ethnicity sex whatever are small enough variances that the same set of biomarkers can work for just about everybody and there will always be exceptions right there are some people who have extremely high ldl cholesterol and will never get a heart attack um, and the same is going to be true here. You could have people who will have very, very, you know, high multimorbidity risk, but actually may be fine. Um, and so there will never be a perfect one size fits all solution. But one of the reasons actually, I think uh, Singapore is excellently positioned to be an innovator in this space because it's got a, an extremely diverse um, an ethnically diverse population set that like, that's exactly where you want to be measuring and, and kind of starting some of these clinical trials. Because if you, you know, we've, we've seen this in the U S over and over again, if you, uh, run your, your clinical trials on a non-diverse population, then as you, like, if you wait until after that drug is approved in order to roll it out to a wider population and a more diverse, uh, a more diverse set, that's when you actually run into the biggest problems. If you do your analysis on the diverse populations at the beginning, usually you can find, you know, the, the solution set that works for all of the ethnicities, um, and, and, and sexes. And so I think that taking that very inclusive approach from the beginning of data collection gets us to a better endpoint. Awesome. So like the signal noise ratio to get that well done. Maybe one last question is, um, what would like the journey look like for an investigator that attracts the interest of Camprian? I mean, you mentioned you work with universities and that's a question from Diogo Barrado. Yeah. So um, the way that this works is that Either an investigator will will contact us, or or we will contact them, and you know have a series of initial conversations around like, hey, here's the breakthrough that we made, and we think that this is actually ready to um, start a drug development effort, um, which would would be created in a, in a little uh, a startup biotech company that Cambrian would provide all of the capital for, all of the R&D expertise, we would do all of the setup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in order to get to that point where there's like a, you know, an actual thing happening, there's a series of really three or four different steps. Um, the first step is that we do kind of a scientific diligence um, and say, okay, hey, This is something that we really think is developable as a drug. And in parallel, at the same time, there's all of these concerns about what are effectively the, the terms for that startup agreement, right? That usually the university has to get looped in, the scientists have to get looped in, and like everyone has to come around the table and say, hey, if we're going to spend a ton of time thinking about how we turn this into a company, we have to get the economics right for everybody first. And so we do those two things in parallel, um, and then and then run that, that new asset through a two-stage investment committee process at Cambrian, where we basically bring in the scientists and say, hey, let's talk first about the quality of the science, what it can do, what the limitations are, and kind of come up with what we think of as like the killer hypotheses, the, the key things that we have to believe if this is going to be a GERA protector or a, or a drug development program, and what are the experiments that we can run in order to test those hypotheses. 
And then number two, we say, okay, now what's the team and what's the launch plan and what's the indication and the market size and all of the other stuff that you need for a biotech company to build this. And once you've made it through all of those gates, which, which we work closely with investigators to, uh, to do, then we uh, create this new Cambrian subsidiary um, with that investigator usually as a scientific founder. How long is the process normally? Is this like a month, three months? I would say, yeah, our, our goal is to be able to do this in between six and 12 weeks. But usually the limiting factor for, for this is the speed of uh, university tech transfer organizations. <laughs> Notorious for being slow in some cases. Exactly. I, won't, I won't name names. Uh, so uh, thank you, James Pyer. I wanted to use your last name once correctly, so I, I had to say it again. Uh, I, I, resp I respond to Pyer and, and Payer. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm never going to, you know, it's a weird spelling, so, so don't worry about it. Well, we'll bring you back at some point to get you an update, uh, get an update from what's going on. So I want to remind people to use the chat function and the panelists and all attendees to let us know your comments. Also, we have news about courses and clinical trials in our credits. So if you want to watch the end of the show, you may find something of interest. Uh, November 4th is a holiday in Singapore, so we will not be having the show. We'll be back November 11th. We'll all be talking to Adam and Tebby. He's a um, Max Planck director in Cologne at the Aging Institute there, and he's very good at identifying new pathways that modulate uh, aging. So we'll have some more things for you to invest in, James, after that discussion. Uh, and um, I'm going to leave you with a little video on what happens to a 90-year-old that goes to space. Thanks a lot for joining us. I was overwhelmed with the experience, with the, with oh. the sensation of looking at death and looking at life. And, and this, you know, what's become... Uh, uh, a cliche uh, of how we need to take care of the planet, but it's so fragile. You, you, people say, oh, it's fragile. No, no, no. There's this little tiny blue skin mm. that, that uh, is 50 miles wide, and mm. we pollute it, and it's our, it's our means of, of living. That's and a, I was struck so profoundly by it. That was such a beautiful, beautiful sentiment, and it brought you to tears. So at, you're, you're 90 years young. Um, what's what's I the keep, big... I keep hearing that. I keep hearing that. <laughs> and, 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 and another factor of this whole thing is I keep saying, yeah, no, I'm not 90. I ride horses. Or not. The whole physical experience of mounting that gantry, of getting into that <laughs> chair, of being weightless, of, of having five Gs. And suddenly, as I'm coming down, I'm thinking, you know something? I'm 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. I got my I'm on